Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at some surfaces in three dimensions. Now, in a previous video, we already took a look at lines and planes, both of those being kind of linear objects. Uh, we're going to put those aside and take a look at something a little more interesting now. We're going to be taking a look at cylinders as well as quadric surfaces. So let's start off by thinking about how we construct a cylinder, first of all. Now, in two dimensions, if we just have the equation x squared plus y squared equals 4, well, that defines a set of points that give us a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. But what about if we were to go ahead and take a look at this same equation in three dimensions? Well, in three dimensions, we're going to be looking for ordered triples now, x, y, and z giving us a point. And each of those points needs to obey the same relationship. You'll see that this relationship only defines a criteria on x and y. z could be anything we like it to be. So what if z could be any real number? Well, what kind of a graph would that give us? Well, let's start off with first octant view. In first octant view, that circle that we just drew on the xy plane would simply be all of the points where x squared plus y squared is equal to 4 and z is equal to 0. So we could graph that right away. But if z could be any value, then why don't we just choose another value and see what that graph would look like. What if we were to choose, I don't know, maybe z equal to 2? Well, that's going to give us an additional circle, but now it's going to be two units above the xy plane. All right, well, we could continue to do this with any value we choose. Why don't we choose to have z equal to 4? And once again, this is just going to give us an additional circle raised four units now above the xy plane. We would be able to do this with any value of z we like, and it's not just limited to integers. It's any real number we choose. So now you can imagine that if we were to put all of these points together, we would form a surface. In fact, what we've just constructed is the graph of the set of points forming a circular cylinder. Now, specifically, we would call this a right circular cylinder since this axis that is through the center of the cylinder is perpendicular to each of these circular rings. So you can see it's very important to note what kind of dimension we're talking about here. The x squared plus y squared equals 4 is definitely an equation that can only exist in at least R2 because it has two variables. But in three dimensions versus two dimensions, we get very different graphs. But actually, if you think about it, that graph in R2 is just this little cross section of the bigger surface that we graph in R3. Now, oftentimes when we think of cylinders, we think of a circular cylinder, but that's not the only kind of cylinder that we might be interested in. Let's take a look at a couple other examples. Why don't we take a look at Z minus Y squared equals one, where X can be any real number now. So you see that there's a relationship between z and y that's going to define points where x can be anything that we like. Why don't we rearrange that equation for z and y? We'll see that that's not just going to be the equation of a circle in the yz plane anymore. In fact, if we rearrange it, we will see that z is equal to y squared plus 1. Now, that gives us the equation of a parabola in two dimensions. That would be a parabola on the yz plane. Now, it's going to have a very similar shape as y equal x squared plus 1 on the xy plane. Just remember that since we're dealing with the yz plane, this is going to be a parabola that is opening upward towards the positive z axis. And that plus 1 that we have at the end there is going to shift this parabola up one unit also on that z axis. So let's try sketching that two-dimensional shape first. We'll draw our y-axis as being horizontal and z being vertical, since that's typically how we show our first octant view. And we'll put the vertex of this parabola at the coordinate 0, 1. Now that is y equals 0 and z equals 1. And then the parabola is going to open upwards. You can always double check that y equals 0, z equals 1 does satisfy that equation. And you can find other points on there by using a table of values. Now we're going to take that graph and we're going to try to put that onto our first octant view and then let x be any real number. We might actually say that x is a free variable. It can be anything that we choose it to be. All right, now to graph this, what we're going to be taking is that basic shape of a parabola 
And then we can translate those points either in the positive x direction or in the negative x direction, but parallel to the x axis. So for instance, this point where y is equal to zero and z is equal to one currently is where x is equal to zero. But we could translate that further forward along the x axis. And if we do that with every individual point, then we should get another parabola that is shifted along the x axis. And there we are. So as you can see, this general surface has the shape of a parabola, but translate along the x axis. And we would call this a parabolic cylinder. And that just goes to show that a cylinder is not always a circular cylinder. You can take any one of these shapes and then translate it along one of the coordinate axes to come up with a brand new cylindrical version of that shape. It might help to add a little shading so you can kind of get a better sense of that three-dimensional view. Now, before I show you this example in Maple, let's take a look at another one that we can sketch by hand. Let's take a look at z equals x cubed, and maybe we only want to have y greater than or equal to zero. Now, this is going to be a little bit trickier to try to graph in first occlant view because as you can see, our z and y axes kind of line up nicely so that we can take a look at that yz plane in a standard direction. But our xz plane, when we're taking a look at this first octave view, kind of has this awkward perspective. So let's start off with the graph that we're already familiar with, z equal x cubed on the xz plane. That's going to give us the graph of a cubic. We have the point 0, 0, we have the point 1, 1, and we have the point negative 1, negative 1 here as a little bit of a reference for the general shape of that cubic. Now, since our first octant view makes y and z a little easier to graph, why don't we rotate around the z-axis and take a look at a different octant view. Using the exact same perspective that we currently have of our xz plane, by using the right-hand rule, we can determine that the y-axis must be sort of pointing into the page. You can double check this once you've drawn all three axes that taking our thumb in the x direction, fingers in the y direction, our palm should point into the z direction. Now we're looking at this from a different octant. And we can go ahead and translate this particular cubic curve forward into the positive y direction. Of course, this view is not exactly the easiest to see the shape, but you can understand that it would be a cylinder in the shape of that cubic curve. Now, what if we did want to take a look at this from first octant view? Well, then we just have to be very careful about how we would go and rotate this view around the z-axis. In our standard first octant view, that cubic curve is going to be along the xz plane, and you can see that the x-axis is actually pointing towards us. So here is our point at the origin, and then our point where x is equal to 1 and z is equal to 1 is going to be one unit above the x-axis roughly around here. And our point where z and x are both equal to negative 1 is going to be one unit below the negative x-axis roughly here. It's going to have this interesting perspective to it, but it's still a cubic curve. And then we can take each of the points on that cubic curve and translate them to the right, and we'll come up with this surface. Of course, it's not exactly easy to see. We could add a little bit of perspective and shading to that. That might help a little bit. Unfortunately, we're only going to be able to do so well with a pen or pencil. So why don't we take a look at maple and see what these two shapes look like for ourselves. Over here in maple, I have a package included called plots. That's going to allow us to use this plot 3D command, which is going to be important for us to be able to visualize anything in three dimensions. So we'll include those commands first. This little full colon at the end there is so that we don't have to see all of the different commands that are included with that package. But if we omit that, then you can see just how many new plotting tools we actually have. I'll put the full colon back for now. Let's take a look at that parabolic cylinder, z equals y squared plus 1. And you notice that I've omitted the z equals for this plot 3D command because it already is assuming that we have some sort of equation of the form z equals y squared plus 1. In fact, this is actually a function, but we'll see more of that in a future video. Let's plot this, and we can see right away that classic parabola. 
However, it's also being projected here along the x-axis. We can see x equal to zero in the middle, positive x and negative x. And we're actually looking at this from our classic first octant view. We can change the axis by clicking on this graph and changing it from this drop-down view. We have a few different options, and if you like to just see the origin at the center where the axes meet, then we can go ahead and change the view to that particular view here. You can see our z-axis, our x-axis, and our y-axis. And right in a way, you may also notice that the scaling is a little bit off. We can always adjust that using this one-to-one -one scaling. And there's our classic parabola. Now, what about that cubic graph? That one's a little bit tougher to draw, so why don't we use Maple for that as well? Again, this is just going to be z equals x cubed, but I'm omitting the z equals. This time around, I'm only going to plot this graph from x equals negative 2 to 2 and y from negative 3 to 3, since x cubed does grow quite quickly. Here we are. There's our cubic curve, and I haven't actually specified y needs to be greater than or equal to 0, but you can still see that classic shape that we tried to draw there by hand. With one-to-one -one scaling, you can just actually see how quickly the two parts of our cubic are sloping upward or downward. All right, now you get a better sense of what these two graphs look like. Why don't we take a look at quadric surfaces now? Now, although I am sure you've heard of a cylinder before, I'm not sure that anybody would necessarily be familiar with quadric surfaces before. So let's start off with some basic information that everybody should be familiar with. First of all, a quadratic equation. In a single variable, let's say x, this could be ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, so long as a is not equal to zero. The solution to this equation would give us either two real unique values for x, one real repeated value for x, or potentially two non-real or imaginary values for x doesn't really give us much of a graph just yet. But if we introduce a second variable, then a quadratic equation in x and y is a combination of all of the terms that would have a degree of at most two. That would be x squared, y squared. Although x, y doesn't look like it's a degree two since we have two variables each to a single power multiplied together, that does give us a degree two term. And then we have some degree one terms and a constant or degree zero term. Now, the solutions to these particular equations will give us graphs on the xy plane. That can give us circles, ellipses, parabolas, or hyperbolas, assuming that a, b, and c are not all zero, in which case we might just get the equation of a straight line. What we're going to do now is introduce our z variable, and this is going to give us surfaces in R3. Let's take a look at all of the possible terms of a degree of at most two. ax squared, by squared, and cz squared. And then we'll look at combinations of two variables, each to the power of one, d, x, y, e, x, z, f, y, z. And then once we run out of all of the degree two terms, we have our degree one terms, gx plus hy plus iz, those are our linear terms. And then we have j, which is simply just a constant. So long as the first six coefficients, a, b, c, d, e, and f, are not all zero, then this becomes a quadratic equation in three variables. And the points that satisfy these equations form a surface. The resulting graphs are called quadric surfaces. Now, we'll be taking a look at graphs of general surfaces a lot more in future videos. But why don't we take a look at a few examples of quadric surfaces? They're going to come up very frequently throughout multivariable calculus. We've actually already seen an example of a quadric surface. That would be our sphere. Let's say we have a sphere at the origin, 0, 0, 0, with radius 3. Well, from our distance equation that we saw in a previous video, we'll know that the equation for that sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. We can already graph that in first octant view. Okay, well, why don't we take a look at a couple other examples that are going to come up frequently now. One of these examples is called a paraboloid, specifically an, an elliptic or circular paraboloid. The equation z equals x squared plus y squared is a very classic example of an elliptic paraboloid. It's actually a circular paraboloid. 
you can get a good sense of what the shape of this graph is going to look like by looking at the coordinate planes, let's say. We can start off with the xy plane. On the xy plane, that's when z equals 0. But if you let z equal 0, the only point that will satisfy this full equation is going to be the point where x and y are also equal to 0. So the only point on this surface on the xy plane is the point at the origin. Why don't we take a look at the xz plane? Any point on the xz plane is always going to have a y coordinate equal to 0. If that's the case, then we have z equal x squared. And we could plot that as a parabola on the xz plane. And now you get a sense of where the paraboloid name comes from. We could do the same thing with the yz plane. On the yz plane, all points have an x coordinate equal to 0. If we substitute x equal to 0 into our surface, that gives us the equation z equal y squared, which again is the equation of a parabola, this time on the yz plane. With a couple of these cross sections, and the fact that we have a single point on the xy plane at the origin, maybe you can get a good sense of what the graph is going to look like. Here's my sketch of that. You can see I've drawn those couple cross sections, and they're both parabolas with their vertices at the origin. What might not be exactly obvious just yet is how we end up with these cross sections of circles. Don't worry, we're going to be taking a look at how to graph functions of the form where z equals a function of x and y in a future video, and we'll be taking a look at what we call these level curves in a bit. For now, it's just good to get a general sense of what a paraboloid looks like. z equals x squared plus y squared is a paraboloid opening upward. You can imagine, if I wanted to switch both of these parabolas to opening downward, z would equal negative x squared minus y squared. That's going to be a paraboloid opening downward. In addition to these two paraboloids, of course, I could also simply shift each of those parabolas upward as much as I like. If I were to add 1 to z equals x squared and add 1 to z equal y squared, both of those parabolas would be shifted one unit up on those xz and yz planes, and that would simply shift the paraboloid up or down. So I can always add, say, plus 3 if I wanted the vertex instead of the origin to be at the point 0, 0, 3 on the z-axis. We'll take a look at this graph in a moment in Maple, but let's do one more example of a fairly common quadric surface. For this next quadric surface, imagine we take that paraboloid where z is equal to x squared on the xz plane and z is equal to y squared on the yz plane and we only flip one of those two parabolas. Well, that would give us what we call a hyperbolic paraboloid. Let's take a look at an example of z equals y squared minus x squared. That means we have flipped the parabola on the xz plane upside down. It's opening downward toward the negative z axis, but the parabola on the yz axis is still opening upward. It's a little bit tougher to sketch this, Maple is going to be very handy, but I'll do my best. Here you can see we have a parabola opening downward on the xz plane. We still have our standard parabola opening upward on the yz plane. You may notice with these couple cross sections that we don't end up with a circular pattern at all. We don't have a circular or elliptic paraboloid this time. The hyperbolic paraboloid name is a little bit harder to visualize just yet. But again, when we take a look at graphing functions of the form z equals a function of x and y, then we'll see these level curves or cross sections parallel to the xy plane actually form hyperbolas rather than circles or ellipses. Of course, similar to our elliptic paraboloid, we could always go ahead and shift this whole shape upward or downward by simply adding a value to the end of this equation. z equals y squared minus x squared plus 2 would simply just shift all of these points upward by 2 units. We could also play around with which one of the two paraboloids is opening upward and which one is opening downward. The big difference between these two shapes is that in an elliptic paraboloid, both parabolas are opening upward or downward, but in a hyperbolic paraboloid, the two parabolas are opening in opposite directions. 
Now it's going to probably be necessary to take a look at these shapes here in Maple so you get a good sense of what they look like in general. So let's flip over here and take a look at these next two plot 3D commands. Since these are already in the form z equals some sort of equation involving x and y, I'm just going to omit those z equals and plot them. Both of these are plotted over the domain from x equal negative 3 to 3 and y from negative 3 to 3. And here is that paraboloid. Now you don't see those circular cross sections just yet. What you can do is you can change some of the view options of this plot. Up here on the toolbar, once you've selected the graph, you can see that we have currently a wireframe. However, one of these other options will allow us to see the kind of contour lines around there. And we'll see that we have all of these circular cross sections parallel to the XY plane. We're going to be taking a look at those again, like I say, in a future video, those are called level curves or contours. And let's take a look at the hyperbolic paraboloid. This one's a little bit more interesting. It has the shape of a saddle. That's going to be very useful when we're taking a look at optimization in three or more dimensions later on. It has a parabola opening upward in one direction and a parabola opening downward in another direction. We can see that this particular one z equals x squared minus y squared is backwards from what I plotted by hand. We have a parabola opening downward on the yz plane, and we have a parabola opening upward on the xz plane. So you can have a saddle facing one or the other direction. Let's take a look at cross sections parallel to the xy plane, and we'll see these hyperbolas. Maybe you can see that if you face straight down, we have hyperbolic curves. Not exactly immediately obvious, and a hyperbola is not necessarily a shape that we see very often, but there it is. All right, well, with that, we have a good sense of some common quadric surfaces. Now, we'll be seeing these and other quadric surfaces a lot more in the future. We're going to be taking a look at things like volumes and taking a look at things like tangent surfaces so stay tuned a lot of this is going to show up again in the future and it's always good to have a kind of a reference of some common shapes now we've got lines planes spheres elliptic paraboloids and hyperbolic paraboloids thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next video